groupthink and decision making during a crisis. And as I said in my sort of blurb, that might be quite useful for a few of you at the moment. So what we're going to do is I, I want to talk about my, my, my sort of quest for decision making. So I want to talk about that. A couple of examples of groupthink in action. And then I really want the main the main sort of bulk of, of this morning's chat is to talk to you about what are the eight symptoms. So what what is out there to recognize that groupthink is taking place and then some measures to avoid it. So um, what you can what you can do in your organization, in your crisis management teams to avoid um, being on groupthink. And I think if you want to read a bit more, this is an excellent paper. I think it is, it's 1977, 1978 by Karen Swite and Ian Bursky called Design on Crisis Decision Units. I think if you ferret around the internet, you, you should be able to find a free copy of it or, or look at it. But I think there's some really good stuff there on decision-making, decision-making on stress, and some good stuff on groupthink. So quite a lot of the stuff has been taken from that paper. And I think that's, you know, if you want to go back to originals and read, read, read a bit on it, then um, that's, that's a paper that's well worth reading. One of the things, and having been an army person myself, I did staff college. So the army is designed for managing crises, managing incidents, fighting wars, and the sort of decision-making process and the, the framework within which for managing crises, battles, all the things the army do, is kind of very formalized as a strong structure and you practice it lots and you have to be taught how to do it. And if you look at some of the sort of um, police or fire brigade or, or ambulance, or if you look at the kind of the FEMA type emergency management from the states, they are all quite rigid, quite formalized, quite complex ways of managing incidents. And they work because people are trained in them, they practice them, and it's like a full-time profession for them. What I've always struggled with in this sort of business continuity crisis management is to say, how do you teach a senior executive who's used to managing, in inverted commas, in peacetime um, crisis, or they're managing sort of their peacetime business without a crisis taking place, how do you get them to manage a crisis which could actually cause the demise of their organization, could cause the demise of their career, and when they will only give you half a day a year's worth of training or half a day a year's worth of exercise? And, you know, that's, speak to a lot of people, the more enlightened ones will give you more time, but they are not going to go on a six-month course like I did in the Army, um, um, or army people do on staff college how to how to organize um how to organize sort of incidents so you're going to have always with your your senior managers you're going to have a very limited contact time or time which they're willing to devote to this so what i've always been on my sort of slightly the quest and that's why it's a quest is tools and techniques and ways of doing things which are simple but effective, but you can teach to senior managers, um, which they can say, oh, I remember that training. Yeah, let's let us let us use that little tool. Let's use that technique because actually that's going to add value to my incident and make my incident response better. And so that's that that bit. Incident that you know, it's run by amateurs. Um, there's a lack of training. And so I'm trying to look at tools available. And the reason I just put this up is one of the things I'm looking at decision making. So how do you get senior executives in incidents to make better decisions? And, you know, that is the Jessup. So that is the interoperability UK methodology of sort of managing incidents. So that's your decision making cycle. And you can see you gather intelligence and information and then you can go around the circle there and you've got 
adoptions and contingencies. Again, for me, that's fine for people who are trained in using it. But, you know, if you stuck that in front of an executive when they're kind of the hearts go in, the, you know, there's a crisis going, things are happening, things are, bad things are piling upon bad things. And you say, right, there you are, there's a, there's a nice sort of circle for you to go around. Even if you manage to teach them this and they've taken the time to understand it, are they going to remember how to do it? So one of my problems is, is yeah, there's some really great tools such as this um, decision-making uh, cycle out there, but actually it's not going to be that much use for executives on the day. So what I've been in kind of um, looking out for is simple things that you can teach, which they can use. And, and sort of when I read this paper on groupthink, that was something to say, ah, right, there's something there that's conceptually quite simple, but we can take, and when we come onto the measures there, you can take those measures or your crisis teams can take those measures or you can suggest your crisis team takes those measures, which I think would help them avoid some of the, some of the disasters you find in, in caused by groups think. So simple tools and techniques there. Uh, Groupthink was developed by Irvin Janis in 1972, so he was born in 1918, so he served in the Second World War, and his job in the Second World War was to look at morale and to look at um, decision making and to do research during the war, and so this is in the end his kind of um, synopsis work. Um, if you look on Amazon, that's just a cut and paste from Amazon, so the book's out there if you want to read the original. And he did his original in 1972, and then again in 1982. So this is, this is not kind of dreamed up last week. This is um, quite a sort of generally well-established um, theory. Now his, his theory, when he wrote his original look, he looked at Pearl Harbor, and he looked at the Bay of Pigs. Um, so Pearl Harbor, massive failure of American intelligence. The many people knew the Japanese were were coming to attack them, and there was a high possibility of this. But due to failure of command, that the basically a large amount of the American fleet was destroyed at harbor in uh, at port in Pearl Harbor. So a large failure of intelligence there. So his book looked at why that happened. And again, with the Bay of Pigs, 1960, 1961, um, this was the American-led invasion by a whole load of Cuban exiles. And basically, the uh, invasion failed, but they didn't have enough troops. The intelligence wasn't wasn't great, and actually helped bolstered Castro and kept the Castro regime on this basically myth going till 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 this day. And again, massive failure of intelligence, not enough troops, not enough, um, and not enough thought went into it. While there were people saying this is not a good idea. So those were the two sort of apocryphal stories that, that he used, and he went into very much of the detail of who thought what and when and why these decisions were making. And kind of and making the point, lots of people were saying around, this is not a good idea, have you thought of this? And they were ignored. And for me, a sort of a great classic and then quite interesting Second World War history was the German invasion of Russia. Stalin believed that Russians would attack him. So basically, as the reports came in from spies to say, look, I can see German tanks and artillery pieces on the other side of the border getting ready to invade us. And this wasn't one source, this was multiple sources. And basically, those sources were ignored. And so the Russians were caught flat-footed there, and the Germans were were, were able to do um, to, to to invade or invade a lot further than they would do if the, the forces were ready for it. So massive failure. You know, you can't hide the thousands of tanks that was there, but 
if you ignore the spies, you ignore your intelligence, then, you know, you, you, you're caught out. And I wonder if it's a little bit, and I haven't got, we'll wait until the report, there'll be a report on coronavirus at the moment. You know, it seemed to me a little bit, the British government was caught flat footed on this. And I don't know, I don't know what the politics there and how the story went. Sometimes, you know, you can see a disaster coming, but you can't actually turn around and put things in place because things take time. But I think in the coronavirus, you know, for for during January, we saw that this was spreading in China, was get it was getting worse, and it didn't seem to me till about sort of beginning of um, March that we really sort of geared up and started to doing things about it. Now, whether this is groupthink or a failure of um, a failure to see it, or people were doing things, I'm not sure. But I think it it seems to me, in my sort of gut, feels about that again this sort of groupthink. And I think there's a few elements of this once we come into the kind of the eight symptoms of group think i think may might resonate with you and you think oh, yeah maybe actually that this was what's happening there there's a definition from the, the the cambridge english business dictionary but i think it's all about bad decisions and this is bad decisions not because i think the key point of this is about it's not just people taking bad decisions people take bad decisions all the all the time and it might be nothing to do with group think but it's bad decisions based upon a group dynamics which people as you can see there don't want to express opinions suggest new ideas and others disagree with so it's it's that What's important in recognizing group thing is about a group and it's about taking bad decisions when there are some there's some people saying that was a bad decision and actually almost in retrospect if they kind of looked at themselves and said yeah actually what were we thinking why did we make that decision it was fairly obvious that was a bad decision but we as group thing and that's not even about hindsight that's about Look, we knew all this stuff and we still took that decision. What, why did we take that decision? So I think you need to differentiate a little bit when looking at great things, it's just bad decision making or decision making in disasters, which we all know you've got to take a decision with limited information. Then, um, you know, that might be the wrong decision. So it's more about this bad decisions and it's more about groups than just taking bad decisions. Right, so let's go through some symptoms. There is um, on the on business continuity training or the Plan B website. This has been written up as a as a blog, so you can go and find it on there, or you can go back to the original. So don't worry too much about the text there. But the first one is there is this illusion of invincibility, high exit optimists, and decisions of very high risks. So basically, you have that kind of group euphoria. We've been really successful. Where it's all going well. Yeah, this very high risk decision comes on, and they just go, "Yeah, bam, that's what we're going to do." And I think I asked for a couple of examples from our consultants there, and I think Jill came up with a very good idea. Was a little bit about um, banking pre the current crisis everyone's making lots of money banks are booming everything is going well we got this we can sell this you know we're selling a whole load of the uh, mortgages packled up as long as the you know the as long as the mortgage the house prices keep going on it doesn't matter whether these guys can't afford it and that kind of the world is going to boom forever and it suddenly came on to and you know that they were the banks were taking lots of risks, which they were making lots of money. It was going well, been very successful up to date, and then bam, fall off the edge of the cliff, and we get the, the kind of global financial crisis. So that's one of the first things. Very successful groups going really well, and then they kind of they take higher and higher risk decisions without really thinking about, say, actually. You know, have we looked at the risk if this decision goes wrong? Have we looked at the risk of it? But, you know, being successful in the past, why shouldn't we be successful in the future? So it's that sort of 
optimism, that kind of, yeah, we're doing great. And then they don't kind of like be the self-aware to say, actually, are we getting in a place where we're taking these higher, higher risks? Because we need to feed on that optimism. You know, some of the small risks we've taken in the past have paid off. So the bigger risks, yeah, that's to say, I'm sure we'll do it fine. So it's this excessive optimism. I think the next thing is warnings, negative feedback, which reassessment of decisions. So basically, very much like the Stalin and Barossa and the Russian, you know, there were warnings coming to say, spies were saying, you know, the Russians are massing here, the Germans are massing here, we can see the troops, we can see the troops, we see the trains turning out, we see the tanks unloading, and then people, and they just ignore the the warnings. They say, you know, no, 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 that would never happen, that would never happen, that couldn't happen. And those people are just routinely ignored. Now they may quite often those people may be sort of more junior. And so, well, you know, he's the health and safety manager, you know, he's always moaning about he's always moaning about risks, he's always moaning about, you know, the scaffolding's not is not put together properly but you know he's just a moaner so we'll just ignore him and those ignorings are the you know the the people ignored and then actually the incident happened and then when you know kind of everyone was always say well why didn't we listen to them well you didn't so anything that if you've got a group view anything that kind of goes against your group view you kind of rationalize it and say well that would never happen that couldn't happen maybe it's a little bit with sort of business continuity and pandemic you know our oh, pandemic will never happen you know last pandemic everyone was saying it was going to be really bad and you know when when um h1n1 came along it wasn't very bad so why are we bothering and you know so so ignore the state rationalize the status quo um i think this is an interesting one and i don't know the dynamics of it but it seems to me is fitting the the volkswagen um the volkswagen one very successful volkswagen very successful sells lots of good cars you know and suddenly you know and the engineers are quite happy to go away and skew the results of the emissions tests and you know did no one ever say to them that that's wrong we're going to get caught you know we shouldn't be doing that and so i suspect there was some sort of group dynamics there that said look we're doing the best for the company we're doing i'm sure they didn't make you know personally the people didn't make any money out of it but you know they were caught up caught up in this and they didn't think about the moral consequences they didn't just think what we are doing is wrong it, we are cheating. We are cheating customers. We're cheating the company. We're cheating the shareholders. So it is teams can invent their own moralities. And if they, if you kind of took an outside view of that team morality, you might say that team is just doing something that that is just not right. So again, about morality is about you know the construction of like, well that's acceptable you know everyone else is doing it they kind of rationalize bad behavior um i think this one maybe is connected uh covid19 coronavirus is that you look at who you're up against and you go uh, you know they're the Chinese. There's lots of Chinese, you know. The uh, the Chinese they're not sophisticated to us, us, you know. They can't deal with the, 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 the this virus is not as bad as we thought it was. We've kind of um, you know, it only, it only it kills a few old people. So you kind of rationalise it and say it's not as bad as everybody's thinking, you know. Was there some xenophobia there? And to say. And to say, you know, that happens in China, but it wouldn't happen over here, you know, we've got better healthcare. And I think, you know, you kind of underestimate your opponent or underestimate maybe other people who dealt with it and kind of think, actually, well, you know, we'd of course deal with it much better. So it happens to us, we'd be prepared. And I think again, you end up with saying, oh yeah, we're fine. 
And then you suddenly realize that, well, it comes to it and you kind of say, whoa, actually, this is much worse than, than we ever thought. And we try to rationalize it away. So that's number four. Um, express doubts, course of actions, arguments, sort of majority. So people don't look at the downsides. They don't think about the downsides. And if you're in the group, you don't even want to sort of everyone saying this and maybe this could be a little bit if you had a kind of maybe you've got a crisis management team which consists of your top management who work together all, all the time so they're kind of quite a tight-knit group and as part of your crisis plan you might have some um additional you might have some additional people who come into the crisis team. You might have the lawyers who don't normally get there, the business continuity person, the, maybe the PR, the director of communications doesn't normally get into the, come into the, the doesn't get into the sort of the top management group. And they come into the team and they're listening to the team and saying, look, I'm not really sure that, the, that this is right, but they don't want to speak up because these guys ought to know what they're doing. You know, they're senior managers and I haven't worked with this team before. So they're right. And I, I don't really want to express my, my my kind of downside against this just in case I'm made to feel stupid or I'm sacked from the team or, you know. So people, and again, with senior managers, if it's quite a hierarchical, you know, I'm only this manager. Can I really tell the chief executive that his or her ideas are not very good? So. You know, there may be implicit pressure for not to say something. So I don't suggest you say that, you know, that will upset that or will set the boss. You know, if you think about the Trump regime, would you really want to question the president when you know the president doesn't like people going against him? And actually, if you're going to get a double barrel in against you with some mocking, mocking of you, mocking of and then you know he's tweeting out that to all your all his um supporters and then you know you've got a vast army of people who are turning against you because you say oh you know charlie mclean bristol you know that that he's kind of um been um be, been slated by trump in his tweets well yeah he must be a bad guy charlie mclean bristol so we're gonna gonna think about that and we're going to pile in on him or we're going to troll him and all that sort of thing so people in that sort of regime don't want to speak up because they know there's a consequences and if they're right they know there's the consequences of going against the boss so that produces a classic kind of group thing you don't want to speak up even if you know they are their direction the the path they are taking is going to lead them off a cliff but you don't say because you're encouraged i'd encourage not to say or that um you don't want to because consequences for you personally may be too great um keep quiet about their doubt so you know people in that sort of regime just like uh, number five they just don't want to speak out and so they just don't bother doing it um they also have this illusion if we all agree then that must be the truth so actually it doesn't matter if i'm having doubts about it i'm not going to express it because everyone else is agree is agreeing to that and the last one is where the this idea of mind guards who actually who shield people against people who so they make sure if you've got a chief of staff who controls access to the chief executive and or you've got a sort of tactical team which um which briefs the strategic team and there is some problems in the operational end there or they discovered a big problem or the plan is not working then they kind of censor the information coming up from your operational teams and um and so that they don't push up bad news from the bottom because actually they don't want the boss or they don't want the strategic team to know what's going on because it it will represent failure and they'll get angry and upset and the rest of it so they kind of these people either like chiefs of staff or whether they're a sort of team may censor the information coming up to suit the picture 
And I think I just wanted to mention when we come about um, number three there is, is, is about, um, if you look again at Boeing and uh, the, the, the MAX crash, you know, there must be people in Boeing who said, well, look, we've had one crash, this is going to happen again. But for whatever reason, that decision wasn't taken, whether that was, you know, and I'm not sure what level that decision was taken, but again, that decision wasn't taken because, you know, maybe they were pushing more for, for money rather than actually saying the moral decision is to ground this because this software is unsafe. So, you know, you look at a lot of these things and say, you know, these are obvious. What, why would anyone do that? But I think the reason why I think this is important, why I put in this webinar is so that maybe you, if you're involved in a response or involved in an exercise, is to kind of take a step back and say, are these things happening? And actually, maybe you want to point out to the team and say, look, you know, I've done a bit of thinking group thing. I think we're going down the group thing void. Can it? Can I suggest we do a couple of things which will come on to now to stop this happening and make us make better decisions? So you can see the solution. You yeah, see, I have an idea. You can see the one on the left, and then I've got some ideas from this paper about how you can um, how you can avoid it. So one of the ideas is here is to say, if you've got a strategic team, tactical team, doesn't matter what the team is, and what you do is before making a decision, say, look, actually, why don't you go and discuss this decision with your team? This is the, this is the decision we'd like to make. Can you go and discuss it with your team to decide if there's any flaws in it? So it's taking a little bit of a, a step back from that decision and say, you know, we're in a crisis situation. We need a quick, it, we need a quick decision. We can't take three days to kind of pull the company and decide and test it and get a few focus groups and things to do that. But I actually say, right, we got, we need to make the decision in the next hour. Can you? This is what we think you're doing. Can you go and discuss that with your teams? Take 20 minutes. Come back and see if anybody's got any issues or any major problems with this so it's trying to get more people involved in the decision or running against some different people maybe some experts there who say look there's a flaw here you haven't thought of ah yes very good point uh, we, we, we forgot about that so discussed externally with their own team to verify challenge the situation quite like this idea is using some tools like brainstorming or something where, where people can have a thought and then present their thought without having just saying, you know, the strongest, the, 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 the very vocal person says their thoughts and everyone just nods, not allowing the other people to do this. And one of the sort of tools and techniques we have for when we're doing um, when we're doing team meetings, and this is this works pretty well. We even do this at strategic level. Is what we say is once we've done the introduce of the meeting, we get each individual um, person around the table to present for two or three minutes on what their issues are for this incident, what information they've got. What are their what are their key issues and um, what decisions they need made by the team? And what we say is to say you have to go around the entire table, so all ten people in the team, before anybody is allowed to comment, um, contradict, say that's rubbish, whatever. So you get everybody to say their view, and you don't. And so what this avoids is the first person does their presentation and then the, the loud person then you say, oh, that's not very good or you haven't really thought or you're a bit stupid. Have you thought of that? You know, and then nobody else wants to talk or you've already got a plan before everybody else's plan is done there. So try, trying to or even just the it's just the under the, the, the chair of your meeting go around the table and say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? 
and trying to get some other ideas rather than yeah just nodding and not even asking other people's opinion there so brainstorming give yourself you know not be constrained by discussion come up with some additional ideas um often you find an incident so though you've got your incident team you quite often find that there may be one or two people who are not intimate or they haven't got as much to do as the other people could be hr could be finance could be lawyers it could be various other security they, you know we have security have our security person on the team but actually this is not a security issue you know they're there because they're important to have a view so you can actually designate a couple of people there to say actually can you go and have a look at the long-term situation there can you go and think about longer term and then they can come back and you know as a part of a scene you should set your instant objectives so can you think about the longer term and then they can go and say well look if you do that We've got our objectives, we've thought about the long term thing, this is not going to contribute to it. So you might want to reconsider that situation. So try and look at it as the as the, the longer term issues. You know, if you think about the Volkswagen thing, if they kind of thought, actually, you know, if we're if we're cheating on the emissions, this is not going to help us in the long term. This is going to knock lots of money off the share price. And the reason why we're doing this is to sell more cars, to make our cars more attractive, to make the company more money. Then this is actually going to be detrimental for it. So actually, this doesn't fit into the long term view. Um, I like this other idea: get one person the role, devil advocate, and chance the group decision. No. Often there is that person already on the team who you find blastedly annoying and actually, yeah, you're always complaining, you're never happy, you know, you're always challenging the throne. But actually, you need that person on the team, even how annoying they are, because you want to get on and do things. You think it's a reasonable idea and they're still moaning about it. But I think it is, again, is to have that person either designated or you know, it's almost a little bit like a war game is to say, actually, you know, this is the this is the red team who's going to think about actually what are the flaws in our solutions. And that's designated roles. We're not just being annoying. We've principally asked this person, these couple of people to challenge what we're saying. And again, that would help the final decision and make it better. As you say, rotate it, just stop becoming domesticated. Um, Again, more exercises you do, the more muscle memory you get, hopefully the better decisions you get. And also, that also gives people to say, look, we tried that in an exercise before. We did that real incident before. Um, you know, that didn't seem to work. Are we falling into the same trap as we did in exercise? Phoenix, that's always a good name for an exercise. So are you, um, you know, give yourself some, some, some examples, some something to look back on, some experience to look back on, and then you can say, look, that we tried that before and it didn't really work very well in the exercise. Are we going to, you know, are we falling into the same trap again here? And I think again here is, you know, I'm a consultant, I would say that, but why not use external crisis communications consultants or even um, crisis communications consultants to sit alongside the team and give that experience to challenge the team to to ask questions to provide advice in the end they can need provide advice they can challenge but it does give you a kind of somebody from outside the nice cozy consensus who can actually maybe see a different view and challenge your ideas and, and, and think about it. In the end, it's your organization. So you're the people going to make the decision. So you may deny to ignore them. And that, that might be perfectly valid. And that might be a good idea in some cases. But again, it gives you that different view and can contribute towards those decisions. So I suppose a little bit in conclusion there, whatever you are the team needs, is an eel. Every team needs a person 
who is going to say, oh dear, it can go very bad, what happens if, but we need that person, you know, you can, you can make a bit of fun of it, you know, you're the designated Eeyore of the day or Eeyore for this meeting, you know, please challenge our assumptions, and, and, and a good team will, a good, you know, chair will say, actually, please do challenge it, because actually we're in a very dangerous situation here, there are a lot of consequences here, and the better our decisions are, are made, then the, the, we're going to avoid some of the dangers. Even the most successful teams make bad decisions and things don't get right. But I think it is, if you can be kind of self-aware on the, on, on the group thing, if you can see yourself, we seem to be going in this direction, or, you know, we're taking decisions that's just morally wrong then at least you can challenge them and say, look, you know, we've done a bit of training group thing. This is, we seem to be going down this thing. Let us wind back. Let us think, let us be self-aware. And almost like if you if you're suddenly challenge it, you know, people might go, oh, yes, actually, we are going down one of those particular eight things with eight symptoms. We are doing that. We need to think about that. And I think... You know, people are aware of the word and they know it's a bad thing. So linking it to groupthink kind of helps make it kind of more intellectualize it and make it more relevant rather than saying, I think we're taking bad decisions. Well, you know, kind of who you to take bad decisions. So I think if we can kind of dress it up as this, I think self-awareness and teams being aware and just and, and, and thinking about their dynamics could actually often help say, yes, that's right, we need to rail back that, we need to think about it. So that is my, uh, that is my thoughts on, on groupthink. And I think it's a good tool and technique for you to take forward, either into your exercises or to just make, to, you know, make that as a tool aware to your um, senior managers. So let's see if we can have some questions here. So how are we doing? Um, right, let's see if we can find some questions. Uh, let's see, Andy Boyd. So you're saying to Jessup, well, it's potentially too complex, will be outlined simpler tools. I think, as I was saying, Andy, the Jessup model is not potentially too complex for for those that are trained to use it. I think it's I think it's too complex for kind of amateurs, people who are going to do half a day's training. I think you need we use a more simpler tool of kind of situation, direction, action, and so you know situation really obvious. Look at the situation, you find out what's going out there you decide what you're going to do, an action. And so these are, these are kind of, um, these are decision, not this, so these are processes for managing incident, processes for managing incident. In terms of the direction, even with the Jessup model, there isn't a tool there, as far as I can see, that tells you how to make the decision. It will present you with the fact and it will present you with the, the variables, but in the end, I have seen very few tools which say, if you do this and you do this, you'll come up with a good decision. You know, there's the, the more information you have, the better decision you will make, but there's no, I haven't really seen a tool which says, you know, if you follow these five practices, you will make a really cracking decision because it doesn't really work, work, work like that. Um, is point one about invincibility or or invisibility or both? I think it. I think it's about invincibility. It's where you've been successful and you've been successful in the past, and you basically think, you know, I think Wolf of Wall Street. You know that kind of yeah, we've been really successful. It's going really well. Duh, 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 but you take higher and higher risk. So I think it's invincibility is the problem. Maybe this might come into the Boeing thing, you know, we're a great company, we've got, you know, 50% of the world's flights, you know, we've got some cracking aircraft, you know, our dreamline has been really good, you know, kind of da 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 da, you know, we can't fail, we're doing a good thing. 
Um, what's your view of Ed De Bono six thinking hats and also OODA loop and helping Venter group group think? Yes, I like I'm not terribly, but I know that the Edward Bono six thinking hats is thinking in different ways, so sort of taking different personas. And the OODA the OODA loop is classic um plan, do, check, act, um, situation, direction, action. It's almost the same as your as your your Jessup things there. So they are all almost the same same thing. Giving yourself uh, giving yourself a sort of a methodology for doing it. I, I like the Uda loop and I teach it because I think it's a good way of, of doing. I think the thinking hats is quite good. It might be quite difficult to get yourself into the different modes for the thinking hats, but I think if you can kind of challenge yourself in a little bit of how you how you make decisions and try and say can you see yourself because we all have our kind of inbuilt bias can you kind of take yourself out of your own inbuilt bias and take on another persona and and how, can that make you think about it a different way so i like your like your hats yeah Ah, uh, Leonard there, would you agree in some cultures much more danger because of the culture yes i think that is I think that is, I think there can be world cultures. So if you're, if you're maybe a culture where, you know, certain countries that does work in the in the Philippines, and the Philippines are very hierarchical, and so you know you never tell your boss bad news. You tell him bad news when you solve the problem. And so culturally that that happens. So people don't want to give bad news. And also, you know, I worked in um, Scottish power, or maybe Scottish, but this was, uh, uh, this was, you know, 12 years ago, so I'm sure they've changed. But again, the culture was very, very hierarchical. So, you know, you again didn't want to kind of annoy your bosses because if you annoy your bosses, then actually your card was marked and actually, you know, your career was not going to be that successful. So, the, you know, you can get the cultures. And I think that's where it, but that's where, you know, you, you can end up. So in, in countries, you can end up with cultures and different organization can end up end up with, with with cultures so i think it is the company culture can greatly contribute towards that um peter there would you agree that good think group think can also exist when the second team leader and i quote it correctly doesn't encourage challenge or posing these i think you're absolutely true on that thing peter and i think that's a very very difficult thing to do is to challenge to challenge the to challenge the leader and say, you know, sir, I don't, I don't know how many leaders get called sir these days, but um, so you know, I think I, I think you're wrong, and I think it is difficult in that you know you can have some autocratic leaders who are brilliant, you can also have some autocratic leaders who are not not brilliant, and I think it is difficult. I don't I don't think you know in the end all this stuff is about people and people are different and some autocratic leaders do not like challenge and um not not naming any in the in, in the usa there but you know that is and it was interesting i read about the i read about i can't remember Fulucci, the, the the guy the, the the guy who's the who's sort of leading on the science in, in america and he he said he was he's been quite a quite famous at the moment for contradicting Trump on very softly contradicting Trump on some of the things he's saying. But 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 he knows in this article he was saying he knows Trump well enough so he doesn't go and go say like that was wrong, you know, you were not telling the truth there. He praises him, he's been nice to him and says, uh, you know, I think this is not quite right, so you should consider this. So he knows the game. There is a game to be played with autocratic leaders. And, you know, you can kind of kind of assert you're wrong and then you'll probably be sacked. But if you can, you know, di team dynamics work out the way of dealing with autocratic leaders. But I think it, it yourself, it is difficult and maybe it's more prone to this sort of thing. Um, from a post, um, this is Kevin. 
From a post income perspective, do you see value in the recording of strategic decision making, the learning of game from extent, the value evidence of the utilizer structured decision making? I, I think, you know, what, one of the things we teach is about decision making and recording of decisions and and doing that. And I think it is there is a really value in it in that of recording why you did it, how you did it. Why, on what evidence the decision was made, um, you know, what, what what information did you know? And then in hindsight, you can say, well, you know, we made that decision, but this this piece of information didn't come in until next day, which if we knew, we would have made a different decision. So I think there is, you know, the police are very, very well of this, and so they're very good at this, and saying, we know if one of our snipers shoot that guy, that decision is going to be poured over, so we know that we've got to record exactly why we did it or why we go and raid that house because they know this will come back to haunt them. So a good team will use their scribes and their admin people to record those decisions. The police will get it signed off by the leader. You know, that, that might be good, good practice is to record that information to that because you know in big incidents these things may or could very well come back to, to haunt you. And if you can understand why you made it, you know, either it's for your own self-protection, but also also the um also the learning afterwards, the more you remember. It was a good thing I was just um I was doing a I went for a wee run yesterday and I was reading a podcast. And one of the things they were talking about was to say there's a theory that in an incident, the only things you ever remember was the worst of it and the end of it. So what should what happened at the beginning and what happened to other parts, everyone forget. So if you think about, if you apply to that theory, some of the decisions that maybe in the beginning may be forgotten about. So, and they may set the tone and set your response and you may, you know, we decide to respond in this way and then we need to change tack. Then you've got why you made that decision at the beginning. So that's a good point, Kevin. Um, ah, you yeah. good to see you. Any tips for deepening analysis of specific decisions during the incident, uh, the incident as, a, as a whole? Hmm, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, it, it's an interesting one. I think discussion, I haven't got, I haven't had any thoughts or, I don't actually, there's a really good point. I haven't really had so many, many thoughts on that is how to debrief a decision. I think if you've got some information there, then you can you can play it back again, and maybe I'm just thinking out here. Maybe what you can do is when you make that decision, and then you're you know in the cold light of day, what you could do is maybe play it back and say, actually, let's have a look at that decision. Let's have a look at what we know because hopefully you've recorded that thing. Let's look at it in respect of was that decision successful? Was that successful actually disaster? And then you can actually play it back and say, actually, you know, can, can we see it in context of the whole in, incident and, and, and play it back and see, actually, could we have done better? Was there something else that we should have known, could have known? So I think that there is worth doing it. It's a bit, a little bit as, as how much you want to get it, how much your sort of team is enlightened and kind of prone to be able to be self-reflect or whether they want to say, kind of like, but <laughs> let's park this one because we didn't do very well. So I think I think it is possible to possible to do that. I think you had to have a certain openness and enlightenment to be able to do that. That's a good point. I like that. Um, is there any more for any more? I think I think we've actually come to the uh, to a uh, a point where it's, it's the end now. So uh, I think anyone who wants to ask any more questions, questions can maybe wait for another time, or they can email them in. If that's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah you can please email them in, or or read my read the blog. So I'll just put group thing and search through the blogs, and, it, and it's there. Or read the paper. Um, so thank you very much, Charlie. Another great session. Um, I'm just going to just going to run a poll and see whether anyone is um, interested in, in changing the time of the of the the, the webinars. Um, and there is, I'm sure, is a reason for some some people wanting a different time. But um, 
So if you can continue just, just clicking on the, uh, thank you for everyone that's uh, participating in that. I can see the results coming in. Um, thank you for everyone that attended, uh, listened in and asked questions. If you know of anyone who may be interested in our webinars, perhaps friends or colleagues, please pass on the message. As we will be running, we will be running as many as we can over the next few weeks. Um, I believe there was a typo in one of the slides, so apologies. Actually, it was quite an important typo, so hopefully uh, we'll send out uh, that the webinar will have a, a mend in it. As I mentioned earlier, you'll receive a recording of the webinar later today. In case you missed out on any of the content covered, all webinar recordings will also be available on our website. We are just in the process of scheduling some further webinars, and a list of these will be available on our website once the final details have been confirmed. We're also getting some guest um, speakers and presenters in, which should be good. Um, but if anyone thinks of anything they might like to do, I'm always happy to do or get some of the other uh, other guys of the team to actually do a webinar. So if you think of any any subjects which are, are burning at the moment, then or something you just think would be interesting, I, I just like yeah, Ewan's, Ewan's idea there. So um, yeah. Um, so I'll, I, I will read the next bit, which just say, does say, if you have any feedback on this web webinar or any topics you'd like to be covered in future webinars, please get in touch, as we'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you for joining us, and we'll hope to see you at next week's webinar. I just was wondering whether we've got, we're just going to leave the um, the poll up for a couple of more seconds. Um, I was hoping that I could, I think we might close it there. We've got most people voted now, and we're going to share the results, because I love sharing results. And then we're going to let you go in uh, in a couple of seconds so thank you very much for attending and i'll see you at the next webinar thank you